virtue is critical. It's critical in our lives. It's critical to our faith. It's critical to our families, to our society. Virtue is essential if we're going to be people who reflect who God wants us to be. Now, here's the thing. Virtue, godly virtue, helps to build us up. Godly virtue helps us to treat others the way we want to be treated. Godly virtue gives us the framework in which how we operate and how we behave begins to live itself out. But misplaced virtue, misguided virtue, virtue that's based on our own thoughts, will, desire, uh, the, the motivation of our own hearts tears down. It puts us at the center at the cost of others. See, the reality is if you study out human history, there has never been a culture, a society, a group of people that has lacked virtue. You can't exist as a people without virtue, but not every group of people have had godly virtue. You can have godly virtue, biblical virtue, or you can have misplaced virtue. So let me give you an example of what misplaced virtue might look like. Say a group of people decides that uh, a virtue is pleasure, that pleasure is a virtue, which that means anything that's unpleasurable is wrong, is bad. If things that are unpleasurable are wrong or are bad, then any law, idea, truth, that restrains, that limits my pleasure has to be removed or eliminated. But beyond that, if my pleasure, if pleasure at whatever level is the highest ideal, it is not wrong to arrest or even murder people who keep me from experiencing the pleasure I want to experience. It's one of the reasons that type of misplaced virtue is why you can see genocide happen. So if virtue is pleasure, the whole world turns upside down. We need godly virtue. We need virtue that is based on the truth of God's word, who Jesus is, who he asks us to be, how he asks us to live. That's what our virtue needs to be based on. And so one of the virtues that we're gonna kick off and talk about here this morning is the virtue of integrity. Because integrity is essential to be a people of virtue. See, in integrity, what it does is integrity is gritty. Everybody say gritty. Hey, I mean, it's even in the word, integrity. You know, it's gritty. And what do I mean by that? I mean, it, it, right, you get grit on something. It helps you to grab on, to hold on tighter, to not lose your grip, to hold on when things are difficult. Integrity is gritty, and integrity helps bring stability or security into your life. We need to be a people who have integrity, integrity of life, integrity of heart. I remember seeing online um, a story, whether it's true or not, I don't know, but this was the story that uh, a, a guy was uh, shopping. He was going out to buy something very, very expensive. Um, and, uh, and he had in his wallet um, somewhere north of $8,000 cash, $8,500, somewhere that, uh, cash in his wallet. And while he was out shopping, he misplaced his wallet. And he was like, oh my gosh, this is not good. He couldn't find it anywhere. He thought maybe he left it at home in his car. He couldn't find it. The way he tells the story is about three days later, someone knocks on his door. Someone had found his wallet, rifled through it, found the ID, went to his house, knocked on his door, said, I, I found your wallet. The guy opened up the wallet and he was shocked. Every dollar was there. Not one dollar was missing. He was blown away. And all the comments on social media reflected that same uh, astonishment. They were, people were shocked. I can't believe somebody would give all that money back. I mean, listen, you should get a finder's fee. Uh, you should get something. I mean, I, people were like, you know what I would have done? I would have brought the wallet back, brought the ID back, brought the credit cards back. I'm not gonna commit credit card fraud, but I would tell the guy, hey, I don't know, the cash wasn't there. I don't know what to tell you, man, I'm so sorry. Other people are like, well, I'd have taken part of it. I'd have given some away. I mean, who needs all that money anyway? But on and on, people were shocked at the Good Samaritan, this person who found the money and brought it back, they were shocked at his integrity. And isn't it a tragic thing that we live in a world that's shocked by integrity? And yet that's the world we live in. 
Because every day, what do we see examples of? People who lack integrity. We see scandal, affair, lying, cheating, financial mismanagement, people misbehaving. We see a lack of integrity demonstrated for us over and over and over. But integrity is gritty. Integrity allows us to pick up that wallet in our hand, see $8,000 and say, I'll give it back. It gives us the stability to be people of virtue in the face of very hard, big temptations that want us to compromise our integrity. So what I want to do here this morning, I'm going to read a few uh, different verses, one from 2 Peter, one from Psalms, and then one from the book of Proverbs. Um, so if you have your Bibles, feel free to turn there and follow along. We're going to start in first, I'm sorry, 2 Peter chapter 1. But if you don't have your Bibles, the verses will be up on the screen and you can follow along. But I am going to ask, would you stand as, uh, in honoring God's word as I read here this morning? Starting in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 5. Make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue. We all say all you need is faith. It's not what the Bible says. It starts with faith, but you have to add things to your faith. Add to your faith virtue or moral excellence. And to virtue, uh, and, and virtue with knowledge, and knowledge with self control, and self control with steadfastness, and steadfastness with godliness. That's the progression. We start with faith, but it's to lead us to a point of godliness in Christ. And now into Psalm chapter 15. It says, Lord, who may dwell in your sacred tent? Who may live on your holy mountain? The one whose walk is blameless, who does what's righteous, who speaks the truth from their heart and whose tongue utters no slander, who does no wrong to a neighbor and casts no slur on others, who despises a vile person but honors those who fear the Lord. The one who keeps an oath even when it hurts and does not char change their mind, who lends money to the poor without interest, who does not accept a bribe against the innocent. Whoever does these things will never be shaken. Integrity brings stability. It brings security. And then into Proverbs, it says this, whoever walks in integrity walks securely, but whoever takes crooked paths will be found out. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you right now. And God, I'm asking that in these next few moments, you would show us some things. God, this is the kind of message that is going to maybe hit home in some areas. Make us uncomfortable. And our natural reaction is to wall ourselves up, to hide our hearts, and to shrug it off. But God, I pray that we would open ourselves to you. God, bring conviction. Make us uncomfortable where we need to be uncomfortable, not because you're mad at us, because you want to change us. God, your word is alive and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. God, would your word cut here this morning like a surgeon's scalpel to remove those areas that are unhealthy so that we can become who you've called us to be, that when we leave here, we would be more like your son, Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen, amen. You can be seated. Integrity is gritty, and integrity brings stability. It brings security. It brings an ability to be unshaken in the face of difficulties. So let me just start by saying what integrity is not. Integrity is not perfection. Integrity is not never making a mistake. Integrity is not, oh, man, I did the wrong thing. I didn't handle that situation the right way. That is not what integrity is. In some, in some sense, it is, okay? In that sense, Jesus was the only one who ever lived a perfect life of integrity, and that is true. But that is not what we mean by integrity, because if that's the case, then none of us will ever live a life in, of integrity, so we might as well give up. So it's not about being perfect and never making a mistake. In other words, if you mess up at some moment in your life, people can't just throw off, well, you lack integrity. I made a mistake, I messed up. Integrity is deeper than just not making a mistake, not messing up. Integrity is the idea of being whole or complete. The root of the word integrity is the word integer, 
Who's, who's the math people here? Anyone. First service, we had one person. I'm not asking you to do any math. I'm just going to ask if you like know what one plus one is. Who knows that? Okay. I'm not even going to ask. I'm just asking if you under, Who remembers what an integer is? It's a whole number. See, none of you took pre-calc or calculus. You just said it could be a number. It could be a variable. It could be X, Y. Uh, no, it's a whole number, right? A whole number. A number that's not a fraction. A number that doesn't have a decimal. It's whole. It's complete. And what God wants for you and for me and for us is to be people who are integrous, who have integrity, who are whole and complete. The problem is most of us live lives that are disintegrated. We're not integrated in how we live. We're disintegrated. We live compartmentalized. We have our work or our school life, and then we have our home life. And the things you say and do at work and the way you handle situations and the way you interact with people at school, you don't do that around mom, dad, brother, and sister. Or we have our social life or our online life, right? Some of you will post things, write things, put comments online, but then we have our church life. And they look vastly different. Or we have our spiritual life and our vacation life. And some of you do things on vacation that you would never do when you're claiming spirituality. We have our private life that we don't want anybody to see. And then we have our public life that we want everybody to see. And what that means is we are living a disintegrated life. Our lives aren't integrated. And what God wants is us to be people of integrity. So as a follower of Christ, this is what integrity is. Integrity is completely or wholly allowing Jesus to direct every area of your life. Jesus has to be leading in every area so that you and I can be as consistent as possible in every area of our lives. That means we can't allow culture society, those who are watching, those who are looking, those who are listening, those who we're trying to impress, those who we want to be friends with, those that we want to date, those that we don't want to be mad at us. We can't allow those things to dictate how we live. We can't allow our own hearts to dictate how we live. Our own wants, our own desires, the things that we long for, the things that we say, this is what I need. We have to say, Jesus is going to lead every area of my life as completely as possible so that I can be a person of integrity. Because if you'll do that, integrity will bring stability because integrity is gritty. And we need that grit in our lives because so many of us lack it. And so when it comes to integrity, one of the things that is essential to integrity is um, being truthful, being people who communicate and handle things with honesty. So what that means is this, honesty is a hallmark and maybe the number one hallmark of integrity. Because if we're dishonest, it diminishes our integrity, it erodes our integrity. So there's two ways I wanna look at honesty real quick. One is honesty with possessions and then the other is honesty with people. So honesty with possessions is kind of like you find a wallet and it's got $8,000 in it and what are you gonna do? And what happens is most of us have been conditioned by society to ask the wrong question. So you find a wallet or forget the wallet because a wallet has an ID, but you just find a a bundle of money. It's just wrapped up in a rubber band. It's in a McDonald's bag and it's laying there and you pick it up and it's $10,000. And you know what we ask? Who does this belong to? Whose is this? But we're asking the wrong question. See, if we ask whose is this, we say, I don't know. I don't know whose it is. Maybe it's mine. Finders keepers. I mean, I don't know whose it is. Maybe God just wanted me to stumble upon this. So maybe it's God just raining down blessings upon me. I don't know whose it is. So maybe I should take possession of it. But that's the wrong question. 
The right question informed by God is, does this belong to me? And you know that answer. If the answer is yes, glory adios. Uh, and uh, come share with me. I want to go on vacation. Um, no. Right? Does this belong to me? If the answer is yes, then it's yours. If it's not yours, then you have no right to it. You have no right to take that which is not yours. You have no right to anything that's not yours. I have no right to anything that's not mine. It's why when we allow internal or external things rather than Jesus to direct us, right? I have no right to her. She's not my wife. I have no right to him. He's not my husband. I have no right to that because it doesn't belong to me, but it makes me feel good. It's what I want. I don't know. I mean, I don't know. Maybe she's the one I was supposed to marry. Maybe I married the wrong person. I'm not sure. And we convince ourselves to handle things in an inappropriate way because we ask the wrong questions. So when it comes to stuff, when it comes to possessions, you have to say, does this belong to me? Is this mine? If it's not mine, I have no right to it. But it also comes to how we handle goods and services. So if you're at a store and they charge you the wrong amount, and you say, well, God's just showering blessings upon me. I found eight grand, and now they mischarged me. That was an $800 dryer. They charged me 80 bucks. This is a great day. No, a person of integrity who has grit, who wants stability in their lives, says, I'm sorry, you mischarged me. It's supposed to be 800. Now, listen, I have talked to people. I've had this happen in my own life where they've rung it up wrong. I've said, this is wrong. They said, it's not. I've said, it's wrong. Here's the, here's the, no, no, that's the right amount. Listen, if you try your best to correct the mistake and they refuse to correct it, then take the blessing. I mean, at some point, stupid is stupid. Um, <laughs> but that's not on you, right? They give you the wrong change. You don't say, oh, look, I got more money than I deserve. And they say, hey, you gave me the wrong amount back. And you correct it. When it comes to things like showing up late and cutting out early on work when you're getting paid for a full eight hours and you're showing up 20 minutes late and leaving 20 minutes early, you just stole 40 minutes from your employer. That's not a big deal. Yes, it is. It's your integrity. And integrity is meant to be gritty. I'm just lying on my taxes. Everyone does it. And I mean, the government doesn't miss waste and misuses and doesn't know. I mean, it's just a big joke anyway. Okay, it's your integrity but also services. So if you're a contractor and you say, I'm gonna build this at this price with this quality material, then you keep that, right? What did we read in the, uh, in the Psalms? It says the, that a person who's upright and holy will keep their oath even if it hurts them. Prices went up, you weren't expecting it. You don't say they'll never know, I'll just bury it in the walls, they're not gonna know anyway. They might not know, you know, God knows. You can go back to the customer and say, hey, listen, this changed. Can we adjust this? The flip side is, listen to me. If you're buying something, you have a contractor doing work, stop asking them to do more, more, more and, be ref and refuse to pay for it. That's not a big deal. I mean, I'm only asking them to move the window like uh, two feet. It's not a big deal. It's not, there's not like an extra window. You don't under, you've never done building if you think that's just not a big deal. There's drawings, there's inspectors. Inspectors get paid to make builders' lives miserable. I mean, oh, that's off by a 37th of an inch. We're going to, you know, you got to get, get a new permit for that. So it, it, it costs them time. It costs them money. And you, you need to pay for that. Don't get mad. They're charging me more. You were the one who asked for the change. Be willing to pay for it. You're at, the, you're at a, a garage sale. And there's some 95-year-old grandma. And she said, I'm finally cleaning up my house. My kids grew up here. And I'm... I'm just selling all this stuff and, and you open up this cardboard box and there's the Mickey Mantle rookie card. And, and you say, ma'am, how much for this card? She says, uh, $50. Oh, that, that you, that's not enough. I'll give you a hundred. Shame, shame. You think you're being a generous person. You lack integrity because you know what that card's worth. Tens of thousands of dollars. And you, oh, I'm giving her a hundred. She only wanted 50. No, a person of integrity who has the grit to be a person that's going to find that stability in Christ says, ma'am, listen, this card is worth $150,000. I can't pay for that. But please don't let someone give you $100 for it. Take this card. Do something with it. If she says, I want you to have it, then you say, oh, God, thank you. 
but don't think you have integrity because you offered her $50 more than she was asking. So that's with possessions, but what about with people? Integrity with people, honesty with people is communicating at the highest level of truth. See, every time, every time, every time you are honest, you strengthen your integrity, you deepen your relationships, and you become more like Jesus. But every time, every time, every time you tell a lie, you weaken your integrity, you become more disintegrated, you damage your relationships, you erode them, and you are putting your wants over Jesus. That's why Jesus said these words in Matthew chapter five. He said, let your yes mean yes and your no mean no. Don't tell stories, don't spin it, don't exaggerate it, don't make it sound like it was and it wasn't. Don't, don't leave details out. Let your yes be yes and your no be no. Be as clear and honest at the highest level of, of truth as possible. Anything more than this is from the evil one. It's from the devil. It's from Satan. Why? Because Satan is the father of lies. And if you are twisting it, spinning it, making it sound, exaggerating, leaving details out, you are operating from a spirit that is not the spirit of God. So let me give you some examples of what lying is. Um, partial truth is a lie. So someone said, I asked you not to text that person. I didn't text them. I didn't text them. No, you chatted with them on Snap. I didn't text them. I mean, it wasn't text, it was Snapchat. Partial truth is a lie. Exaggerated truth is a lie. Hey, I just want you to know I, I prayed for you this morning. When the reality is they passed through your mind for about three seconds when you thought about them and you didn't really utter a prayer, but you want to sound spiritual. I prayed for you this morning. No, you didn't. It's an exaggeration. Say, hey, I was thinking of you real quick this morning. Everything all right? Be honest. You get the teenagers, I'm, I don't know why I didn't, I don't know why I got an F on the test. I, I studied real hard. No, you sat with the books open on the dining room table and stared at the wall for an hour and a half, zoned out completely with your earbuds in listening to music. You didn't study hard. I studied for an hour and a half. No, you didn't. Just because your books are open doesn't mean you're studying. So exaggerated truth is a lie. Here's another one. Truth, false truth can actually be a lie. So someone says to a child, is everything okay at home? And the child's mad at his parents. Yeah. Well, this week's okay. Dad didn't get drunk and beat mom. Well, that's true. Dad didn't get drunk and beat mom. But it's a false truth because dad never got drunk and dad's never beaten mom. But in saying that statement, it leads the listener to believe that dad often gets drunk and beats mom. Oh my gosh, I can't believe that that's what you deal with at home. Yeah, I mean, there's weeks when dad doesn't do it. Every week. But you leave that out. That's a lie. Now, what isn't a lie? Okay, um, make believe. Pretending isn't a lie. You're, you're planning a surprise party for someone. Hey, where are we going? We're going out to dinner. You lied to me. No, it's a surprise party. It's not the lie police. Yeah, you, uh, holidays are coming. So there's holiday traditions that some of us like to have. If you like to have those holiday traditions, please hear me. And all that's good, right, and holy, you're not lying to your children. Please be free from it. And anybody who's who you are, just send them to me. I'll deal with it. I'll deal with the fallout. And, and if not, then Bob Mitchell will, because he is the holiday tradition. Um, right. here's, here's another one that's, that's, that's just not a lie. You're getting ready to go out to dinner. Guys, your wife says to you, hon, does this outfit, does this dress make me look big? Baby, it doesn't matter what you wear. You are a knockout. That's not a lie. That's not a lie. That's saving your life. No. <laughs> That's avoiding marriage counseling. No, right? It's, you know what else isn't a lie? Changing reality. So you and your spouse tell the kids back in April, hey, this fall, we're going to Disney World. 
We're going to take the whole family, go to Disney World. It's going to be, we're going to go for 10 days. And somewhere between April and the trip, you lose your job. Your company downsizes. Mom loses her position. And you go back to the kids and you say, we're not able to go to Disney World. And they say, you lied to us. No, you didn't. Life changes. It's not a lie. That's just called changing circumstances that we have to adapt to. But it's important that we become people of integrity who handle our possessions and our communication at the highest level of honesty as possible. It's what we're called to do. Because if you don't, you'll begin to compromise. So let me ask you a question. What's your integrity worth? What's your integrity worth? Because most of us have a point at which we'll compromise our integrity for something. And it may be in the distant past, but if you're like me, it's probably more in the recent past. And when you really start thinking about it, you go, yeah. See, we all get on Esau, right? I mean, he sold his birthright for a bowl of stew. What's your integrity worth? Not getting in trouble? What's your integrity worth? Closing the deal? What's your integrity worth? Spinning the story so you look better and get a better reputation with people? What's your integrity worth? That high that you just can't live without? The taste of alcohol? What's your integrity worth? You have to ask yourself because we all have those things. When you look at your behavior, when you look at your actions, when you look at you hand, how you handle things, it will reveal to you what your integrity is worth. It's worth getting a better grade on the test by cheating. It's worth getting a better job by lying on my resume. It's worth getting a higher salary by lying about what I make now so that I'm in a better negotiating position for that job. It's worth fudging on my expense report. It's worth just shifting some numbers around on that insurance claim. What's your integrity worth? And if we don't have the grit of integrity, we'll sell out for a bowl of soup. We have to say, I want the security that integrity brings. But it means being complete, whole, consistent. Not acting one way here and someone else there. Wearing one hat here and a different hat there. Talking one way here, talking a different way there. Listen, if you've ever lived like that, if you've ever lived a disintegrous life, a disintegrated life, you know it's exhausting. It is so exhausting. What am I supposed to be? Who am I supposed to be? How am I supposed to act? And then it's exhausting because you're constantly worried, will someone find out? I hope they don't find out. Oh gosh, if I get caught, it's gonna be bad. It's not the way God wants us to live. So there's this story in the Bible that represents this. And we don't talk about this story a lot. And and I don't know why we don't. I have some feelings about why. Probably one is that it has to do with money. So people think it's all about money. And and if you don't give money, then God's going to kill you. Um, And that's not the point of the story. Other people think it's not the, we don't like to talk about the story because it seems harsh. But it's not the judgment of God that's the issue. It's being people of integrity, of honesty. So here it is. The church has just started. It's exploded on the scene. People are coming to faith. Thousands of people are getting saved. Every day, more and more people are coming to Christ. And they want to help each other and support each other because their lives are being made miserable by the culture around them. And so those that have extra, that have houses and possessions and businesses are selling it all. And they're bringing their proceeds and they're laying it at the apostles' feet. And everyone's like, this is awesome and this is wonderful. Everybody wants to get in on it. And so this, uh, this couple, Ananias and Sapphira, say, hey, we want to be in on this. We want to look really good. We want to look like something that we're not. We want to behave with a lack of integrity. And that's the point of the story. And it's found in Acts chapter 5. Now, a man named Ananias, together with his, with his wife Sapphira, sold a piece of property. With his wife's full knowledge, he kept part of the money Back, Peter said to him, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit? Let your yes be yes and your no be no. Anything else is from the evil one. And Peter says, that's what Jesus said. And if Jesus said it and you're acting from a position of lie, your yes isn't yes, your no isn't no, you're lying. This is from the devil. Why are you allowing this? You had this property, you could have sold it for whatever you wanted to sell it for, and you could have done anything with the money you wanted. But you can't and said to everyone, this is everything that I got. 
You put on a big show and you lied to the Holy Spirit. Didn't the land belong to you before you sold it? And after it was sold, wasn't the money at your disposal? What made you think of doing such a thing? You have not lied just to people, but to God. When Ananias heard this, he fell down and died. And we say that's harsh. And God says integrity matters. Honesty matters. Truth matters. I want you to have the grit of integrity so that you could have the security when you are standing there holding a wallet with $8,000 in it that you would say, it's not mine. When that girl begins to flirt with you and you want everything in you biologically to do some things that you want to do, you say, she's not mine. And I'm going to have the grit and the determination and the integrity to stand securely in who I am, who God's made me, and not give in. And we say God's harsh. Well, it gets worse. So Dan and I just falls over dead. They drag him out. They bury him. A few hours later, his wife shows up, and here's what happens. It says, Peter asked her, tell me, is this the price you paid for the land? Yep, that's the price. Peter said, how could you conspire to test the spirit of the Lord? And at that moment, she fell down and died. See, God takes this serious. Listen to me, it is a dangerous, exhausting way to live, living a life of deceit, spin, half-truth, innuendo, kind of just exaggerating, telling people what you think they want to hear, trying to make yourself look better than you really are, trying to just work the system so that everyone says, oh, wow, look at them. It's exhausting. Now listen, at some point, it's going to cost you. It may not cost you your life. Listen, I've been pastoring for uh, well over 20 years. I've never seen someone fall down dead when they made it seem like they were giving their tithe and they weren't. So I'm not saying you're going to fall down dead. You might. I don't, I don't recommend trying it. I'm just saying I've never seen it happen, but it will cost you. It might not cost you your life. But if you continue to live a life of deceit, a life that lacks integrity, at some point it will cost you. It will cost you your reputation. Maybe it'll cost you your family. Maybe it'll cost you your marriage. Maybe it'll cost you your business. Maybe it'll cost you your friendships. Maybe it'll cost you your finances. But it will cost you because eventually those things are gonna get found out. And so in contrast to Ananias and Sapphira, David writes this psalm. Psalm 139, and in that psalm, there's a prayer, and it's a powerful prayer, but it's a hard prayer to pray, and here it is. It says this, search me, God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. See if there be any wicked way in me, and if there is, change me so that you can lead me in the way everlasting. God, If there's lies, if there's deceit, if there's areas of my life where I'm compartmentalized, if there's areas in my life where I have disintegrated my life, please show that to me, reveal it to me, and then change me, lead me on the way everlasting. God, show me. I I don't want to be like this. See, what we think is when I mess up, all I got to do is ask God to forgive us. If I just say, God, forgive me, he'll forgive me and he will. The Bible says he'll forgive us, but we miss the greater point. God doesn't want to just forgive us. He wants to change us. Lead me on the way. So it's not just saying, God, forgive me. It's repenting. See, forgiveness says, God, just just make, make the ugliness gone. And then I can go back and do the ugliness again. And then you can forgive me again. And I, repenting says, God, forgive me and then change me. Lead me on a new way in a different direction. If this was lying, I want to tell the truth. If this was stealing, I want to be a person of honesty. If this was being deceptive and exaggerating, I want to be a person who communicates at the highest level of truth. I want to be different. Lead me on the way everlasting. God, search me, try me, show me those things. See, it comes down to this. You have two options. You can pray out, God, search me, or you can dare God to strike you. You can ask God, please search me, please search me, please search me, or you can dare him to strike you. And I know where I want to live. God, search me. God, show me. So many of us thumb our nose up at God and say he's not going to do anything. And we live a dangerous way because it will eventually cost you. 
So we have to say, God, search me. Search me. Show me those things. Reveal those things to me. I don't want to be like this. God, help me. Change me. Show me those areas where I've fallen short, where I've been less than. Now, the reason we don't like to pray that prayer is because if we mean it, if we say it and mean, listen, you can pray any prayer and not mean it, and it doesn't matter. But if you really mean it, here's the thing. God will answer it. And when he answers it, sometimes he answers it directly. Sometimes he answers it in a setting like this with a pastor on a pulpit and he's preaching and, and, and you, there's somewhat level of, of animosity. Uh, 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 and, you know, yeah. you're, you're anonymous. Anonymity? Yeah. If I could speak English, it would help. Um, Right, and, and you don't know, nobody knows, but there's other times God will show you. He'll show you through your spouse. He'll show you through your kids. He'll throw, so show you through a friend. He'll show you through your circumstances because you'll get found out, you'll get called out, you'll get caught. And you'll say, God's punishing me. No, God's not punishing you. He's wanting to perfect you. And so he's allowing those things to be seen because of the prayer you pray, God, show me. See, when you pray, God, show me, it leads you to integrity. But when you say, God, I'm daring you to strike me, it will lead you to repercussions. And when those come, they're not fun. Integrity, having integrity is all that matters. But when you don't have integrity, it's all that matters. So we have to get to the point where we say, God, I want the security that comes from integrity when I'm centered in Christ. Now, here's the thing. When you begin to pray that, God, show me. He'll show you. And when he does, here's what you need to do. You need to acknowledge it. You need to own it. You need to say, yep. Maybe it's because you gossip. Maybe it has to do with your finances. Maybe it has to do with exaggerating, putting a spin on things. Maybe it's because you've lied, stolen, cheated, defrauded someone. You need to acknowledge it and own it. So what you do is you say, God, forgive me. Forgive me for what I've done and change me. I'm repenting. I want to go the other way. Acknowledge it and own it with people. Would you forgive me? I did this. You may have to deal with the repercussions, but what you're going to find is that a lot of people will not just forgive you, but they will help restore you. God, I'm so sorry that I lied and I cheated. Will you forgive me? Then you go to your spouse. Babe, I messed up. Would you forgive me? Dad, I didn't really tell you the complete truth. And I'm sorry. Will you forgive me? You go to your boss. I, I stole. And I'm so embarrassed and ashamed. That I stole from this company. When you acknowledge it and you own it, you may still deal with some fallout. But it strengthens you and you become a person of integrity. See, here's the thing. Integrity is easier to keep than it is to recover. But it can be recovered. If you've lacked integrity, God can restore it to you. But it starts by acknowledging it, owning it, walking in a different path, walking in a different direction. And each time you're more honest, you're more truthful, you do things that have integrity, it begins to build more integrity in you. And all of a sudden, you become more stable because integrity brings stability. And that's what God wants for us. He says, I want you to be stable in everything. So we have to get to the point where we say, okay, God, I don't want you to strike me. I want you to search me. I want you to show me. I want you to reveal some things to me. And then let him do his work. Listen to his voice. Let him move in your heart and in your life. That he would make you into a person of integrity. I said earlier, it's a tragedy that we live in a world that's shocked by integrity. But you know what? As the people of God, it's a wonderful opportunity. Because if you and I, if all of us become people who operate at the highest level of integrity as possible, when the world looks and goes, I can't believe they'd handle it like that. I can't believe they'd respond like that. It costs them. It costs them big time. But look at how they handled it. They're unshakable in the circumstances. They have the grit and the determination and they don't compromise and they don't give in. Let the world be shocked at our integrity because the world will take notice that we're a people of integrity. And it might just be what the world needs in order to say there is a God and he 
is good. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love. We thank you for your goodness. God, we thank you for the call that you've given us to add virtue to our faith and to be people of integrity. Now, just in a, continue in a spirit of prayer, if you would, but I just want to say something. There may be someone sitting here this morning or joining us online, and you say, I've lacked integrity in just about every area of my life. As a matter of fact, I'm sitting here this morning, I'm listening to this right now, and I don't even know who I am. My life is so disintegrated, so compartmentalized, so broken down into different areas. I don't even know who I am. I sit at church and I know a lot about Jesus, but there's no Jesus in my life. Here's the thing. God says, if you want to be a person of integrity, it starts by letting me take your disintegrated life, your broken life, your life that is not whole and giving you a new life in Christ, being made holy, new, and complete, lacking nothing, allowing me to make you into a person of integrity. See, God said, I know you can't do it. And so I will come as one of you, as Jesus, the perfect son of God who lived a perfect life, but died a brutal death. And on the cross where he died, he became sin for us. He took all of our sins on himself. And three days later, by the power of God, he was raised from the dead. So that if you, if anyone, no matter what you've done, if anyone calls on the name of the Lord, they will be saved. The old will go and the new will come. He will make you into a person of integrity. And if you would say, I want that this morning. I need that this morning. I want to come to faith here today. Here's what I'm going to ask you to do right now. If you would just slip your hand up, raise it up high. Just say, I want, I want to become a person of integrity. And I've never done this before. I've never given my life to Jesus or I gave my life to Jesus and it was so many years ago I can barely remember it but I know I haven't lived it and I want to start today. Now whether you raised your hand or not I'm going to ask everyone would you repeat this prayer after me? Just say these words after me. Heavenly Father I come to you now and I give you my life my broken life my disintegrated life and I receive new life in Christ. The old is gone and the new has come. Make me whole, make me complete, make me a person of integrity. Fill me now with your Holy Spirit so that I could live for you, that I could tell others about you. And God, let me know beyond a doubt that there's a place waiting for me in heaven. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen, amen. If you prayed that prayer, welcome to God's family. Here's something I'm gonna ask when we wrap up this morning. Just come, let someone know. They wanna help you take those next steps in following Christ. But as we continue in prayer, please, if everyone would just stand to your feet. Just stand right where you are. Maybe right now, you would say, the Holy Spirit's showing me some areas. He's pointing out some areas that I don't wanna acknowledge, that I don't wanna admit, that I don't wanna own but I know I've lacked integrity. I know that I've, I've bis, been disintegrated. I've lacked an integrated life. And I don't want that anymore. I'm embarrassed by it. I'm ashamed by it. And I want to be different. I want to be changed. Right now, if everyone would just close their eyes in an attitude of prayer, if that's you, if you would say, I want for God to search me right now. God, search me. Don't strike me. God, show me. I don't want to dare you to strike me down. God, show me those things. You have showed me those things. I know what those things are. And you say, I want to repent of it. I want to ask forgiveness. I want to change. I want to be led on the way everlasting. I want the security that comes with integrity. I want the grit of integrity. I want Jesus to completely and wholly lead me in every area of my life that's you right now, just raise your hand. I want to pray that prayer. God, search me. Just raise your hand. Hold it up. Hold it up. If you have the courage to say, God, search me, search me, search me. Heavenly Father, I pray for every hand that's raised right now. God, search us. Show us. Reveal to us. Don't strike us. God, don't strike us. Show us. 
be merciful. Move in our hearts. Change us. Forgive us. We repent of our sins. Help us be different. Lead us on the way everlasting in Jesus' name. And God, I ask now that by your grace, you would move through your spirit. God, if you would heal us, we'll be healed. If you'll change us, we'll be changed. God, make us holy and completely new in Christ that we would be people of integrity. Let's worship God. If you'd like, please come forward. The altars are open. Let God move in your heart now.